Greatness. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. As we finish the Step Now series, I do want to mention as we get into this, go ahead and go to Isaiah 6 so you're already there. As you're turning, let me just mention that uh, we put together um, probably, I think, one of the single most powerful messages the Lord's ever allowed me to, to share, Stop Tolerating Jezebel. And so we put that in a single CD cover. So it has some extras out in the foyer area if you want to pick that up. Suggested donation of $3. You don't have the $3, that's fine. When we finish this series, Step Now, it will be, this one will be in there and it will be a four-part series. Explaining tonight, I know that Pastor Drew and Diana mentioned it, just to make sure you understand, for those of you that came in late, we have two venues for you to choose from. All three vans will be going to Plummerville, our sister church. And I'll be beginning a revival tonight at 6, Monday and Tuesday night at 7. Um, but we'll be taking the vans tonight. Those who like to go with us, we'll be leaving the church at 4.30. Or you can take your own personal vehicle, of course. But there will also be a service here. There will be a teaching to farther what I'm going to teach you today on the greatness of God. And one of our CE teachers, John Sorrell, John, wave at us. The Lord, I believe, as I was praying, put it on my heart to ask John to teach tonight. A lot of times we do something different around here, but I believe he put that in my spirit, on my heart. And so those of you that can't go, and we will have a, a van that's going to leave early, about 8 o'clock, because those of you that know me, when we talk revival, altar call will probably go till 9 at least. So those of you that say, I can't leave by 9, there will be a van leaving by 8. So if you want to go get on the early van, you can get back home by 9.30. So two venues to choose from, leave the church 4.30, Plummerville or be here six. Everybody say praise the Lord. Step now into greatness. We've learned that step now is to step now is very important. It's vital. It's necessary. We cannot wait. I believe what we've heard from the Holy Spirit just reemphasizes that. And so I want to tell you today that in order for us to step in the direction that God wants us to, in order for us to step forward into all that God has. We must step into greatness. Now our part, stepping into greatness, doesn't change the fact that God is great all by Himself. The reason that I can step into greatness and have greatness oozing out of me is because God is great and greatly to be praised. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Bad English, but get your attention. There's nothing that I can do about it. There's nothing that the devil can do about it. He is great and he is greatly to be praised. And if I will step into him and into his greatness because he is great, greatness will ooze out of my life. He will give me the greatness that I need to be courageous and step on the battlefield and face the Goliaths of this life and them not stop me. Move forward and be used of him to do great and mighty things all for his honor. Even though they begin to sing, Saul slew his thousand and David his ten thousands. David had a humble heart that was after God and he took no pride in it. God isn't looking for superstars. He is, there is only one star. I say it all the time, but it bears repeating. His name is Jesus. So this isn't about position. This isn't about being something or somebody. I want a title. Or for those of you who say, I don't want a title and I don't want to be seen. It's not either end of the spectrum. It's somewhere in the middle that says, my God is great. And therefore, he is greatly to be praised. And therefore, I'm not going to sit on the back and bury my head and say, I'm just nobody, I'm nobody, I'm nobody. But I'm not going to sit on the stage and say, I'm somebody, I'm somebody, I'm somebody. But somewhere in the middle, I'm going to say, he's everything, he's everything, he's everything. And so I link arms with his greatness. I'm going to get my head out of the sand and say this great thing that God does in me and that God does through me. To God be all the glory. He has done great things. See, it's not either or, it's both and. Some of us think, study, study, study. Have disciplines, discipline yourself, work hard, study the Bible, pray, go to church. Yes, that's true. But disciplines alone will not cause you to walk in the greatness of God. Discipline partnered with experience. Watch this. Experience alone will not cause you to walk in the greatness of God. It's not either or, it's both and. Too many people in the church are one or the other. 
experiential or discipline. It's like people get locked in. What are you looking at? Sharon didn't know what I was preaching. What are you looking at? Some people are looking at, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, study, go to church, go to Bible study. All that's good and true. But it's also like, there are moments when he just wants to step in to my life and reveal his greatness. It causes me to rise up in courage and apply what I've been disciplining myself to read, to learn, and to hear. Are you getting this? It's not either or, it's both and. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you need both. So can I say to the, the crowd that's, that's all about discipline, uh, uh, try, try, try to experience him. Try it. You'll like it. Now, 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 can I say to this crowd over here that, I'm driving Missy crazy over there. To this crowd, it's all, it's all about experience. You know, you, you have your experience and then outside them doors, the devil comes and boom. And you're like, wait a minute, where did those doodads go that I felt during church? And there are no goosebumps. There's nothing. What am I going, what am I going to lean on? What am I, it's, it's back over here where he, he said in his word, I'll never leave you or forsake you. It's that word that I've been studying. It's that word I've been looking at. I took notes in Pastor Ronnie's ser sermon, so I, did, I didn't just hear it on Sunday. I, I, I read through my notes during the week, and I spent time in prayer. And then, uh, you know, there are no shortcuts. I started reading in the book of John because it's one of the most easy gospels to understand. And, and then I read on over the book of Acts because some people started teaching me about book of Acts based on their uh, belief system. So I'm just going to open my mind and read for myself. And then on into Romans. And, and you hear what I'm saying? And so... I got a word to lean on along with the experience. <laughs> or oh, are you getting this? It's not either or, it's both and. Are you with me? And so today what God wants you to do is step into greatness so that you can step now into the place close to the Father's heart who desires that with His greatness you begin to recognize, report, and remap in your life. Those are three key words. Everybody say three key words. Now I want you to stay with me. I'm going to preach fast if you'll listen fast. Look at your neighbor and tell them, listen fast. Those of you who are taking notes, write down number one, recognize or recognized. You're at Isaiah 6, right? Isaiah recognized the greatness of God. To see God as great and greatly to be praised in a new dimension than ever before and for that revelation to ever be increasing is to recognize that he is a great God. In other words, some of us have had a measure, look at this, I'm back over to this side of experiential. We have had a measure of revelation that God is great. Can I tell you, he wants to deepen your measure. He wants to show you he's even greater than what you thought. <laughs> so... He wants to increase that dimension of your experience in His greatness. Isaiah 6 verse 1 recognizes the first key word. We know it with our head, discipline, but sometimes we don't know it with our heart, or at least the dimension by which we know it is, is too, what's the word, shallow. He wants you to go deeper, deeper, deeper. <laughs> Isaiah 6, verse 1, if you're there, say amen. amen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It'll be on the screen or in your Bible if you have it there. Read with me. It was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. My goodness, I just feel his presence right now as I'm reading that. You say, you're just hype, preacher. You're just, no, I'm telling you, I feel his presence. He's here. He's here to correct whatever needs to be corrected in your life. Don't leave without being corrected. You know why some people aren't corrected? Because they're, they're adults or either they have decided they're going to be an adult as a teenager and therefore refuse correction. You know what? I say, God, if I'm out of line, correct me. 
This isn't in my notes, and I'm trying to read Isaiah 6, 1, but God just says, in this room, there are people that need corrected. And it's not that you're off bad, doing something really horribly bad. It's just that you are out of alignment, and He wants to correct you. And today, He will help you be corrected if you'll just humble yourself as an adult or as a teenager who feels like you're an adult and let Him correct you. I would... <clears throat> I would rather God correct me before I'm in trouble than to get in a place of trouble and say, all right, now, God, I have no other choice. Correct me, please. Too many Christians, too many people, including Christians, wait for correction when they're in over their head. You don't have to wait. Be corrected now. What do you mean by corrected? Well, of course, it can be sin in your life. You're here, you're living in unconfessed sin, you need correction. You're here as a prodigal, you're running from God, you need correction. You need to get saved. You need to get right. You need to repent. You need to come back to God. You need to get clean. You're here living as a believer, but when nobody's looking, you're getting drunk, you're getting high on drugs, you're committing adultery, fornication, looking at uh, pornography, and you say, well, I'm not really touching her. But if you're looking at her, you're committing adultery in your heart. You need to get corrected. You say, Pastor, you don't understand. I started as a teenager, and it's just an addiction. I understand it's an addiction, but I also know that in this experience God will break that addiction and then if you'll get in church and get in the word and get with some brothers and confess your faults one to another so that you may be healed in the experience and in the discipline you will be delivered <clears throat> porn is one of the large bless you largest tools in America that Satan is using across this country and now he's made it even more accessible and it's a great tool. Thank, thank God for smartphones and so forth and they're, when they're used properly. But there's so much improper use because there's a lot of people that no longer have to hide it at home in a, in a, in a uh, computer. Now they can just be in their car alone and, and bring it up. I'm telling you, it's time to be corrected. Where was I at? Verse 2, attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. I love the way the New Living Translation pushes that. Heaven's army, the Lord of heaven's armies. Did you know God has an incredibly great army? And much of heaven's armies is here on earth. You know why they're here? For you. <laughs> and you thought you were alone. You're going to sleep at night and angels are just looking over your bed watching you breathe. And saying, devil, you can't take their breath. God still has a word for them. Pew, get out of here. You're not alone when you're sleeping. Heaven's armies watching over you. And they're like, that blood covering salvation thing. We're angels and we're 10 feet tall or whatever. And we're all bigger than them. But man, they got some power, some stuff. I wish we could have that. Wow. The, the Bible says the angels look in and they are amazed at the, at the redeemed. Qualified. Some of you don't even know who you are. I saw Miss Eva up here a while ago praising uh, during worship. Now, you, see, we don't even know some of us what some of us have been through and... Some of you heard me share this, and I, from before, I think she doesn't mind me sharing, but just a few months ago, she lost her young son, a few years younger than I did, unex I am, unexpectedly. And yet, during a service, she can come down to the altar and, and do this and praise. Now, now, can I ask you, what has you stuck that you can't do that? Now, don't just misunderstand me. You don't have to, you know, I don't have the personality to get out like she did and blah, 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 blah. No, you don't, you don't have to come up front and do it. Some of you can't even do it right there at your pew. And that's part of the correction that God wants to do because your heart is so hard that because your young son passed away too early. Now, that's an example. You understand what I'm saying? Something that shouldn't have happened happened and it's broken your heart. And so you can't, you can't do this. I mean, this is about the best you can do. <laughs> so it's experience 
and discipline. I'm not, and I promise I'm not trying to be mean because when I saw that, I thought, oh my Lord, could I do that? And my answer is no, not without a miracle. If that happened to me, I'm staying at my pew because I'm hurt. Still, a few months later, I would still be hurting. But that's a miracle. And the God of Isaiah 6, and I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And the angels and the seraphim cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of heaven's armies. Isaiah experienced that army, that Lord, and he began to recognize his greatness. Can you, do you see how great he is? If not, you know what you need? A fresh experience in his presence. And then follow up the experience with some discipline. Don't let the Bible collect dust all week. I tried that thing, that experience thing, you, you, you full gospel people, man, that don't even work because you just go back out of the church and just act the same old way. That's because you're not hearing the whole message. Here's the whole message. I saw the Lord. Now, I read about the Lord. And I studied it all week. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for brethren to dwell, dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard. The beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. So I read this during the week. Psalm 133, 3. And therefore, I was over here on Sunday. There I behold the Lord high and lifted up. Experience. I recognize he is great. But then over here I was disciplined myself. And I read Psalm 133. And then when I was right here in the middle and I was out there in the real world and somebody tried to get me to gossip, I said no because I had that and I had that. And the Bible says, that unity causes the oil of God to flow down and so I may not always agree in opinion with my brothers and sisters in the Lord but I'm going to stay wrapped up in unity at the feet of Jesus and we're going to be one church for the glory of God going after one thing which is to honor and magnify Him hallelujah preach preacher thank you I will with his help, because he is great. Whew. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. Can you imagine? It's not even God's voice. It's the voice of the angels. It's the voice of the, those folks that are looking over you, watching you breathe. Shook foundation. Entire building was filled with smoke. And then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed. This is Isaiah. I'm a sinful man. Notice this is before Calvary. And so Isaiah is living under the Old Testament, the uh, Old Covenant. And he said, I'm dead. I'm dying. This is it. Life is over. Why do you think that? Because over here, he's experiencing, recognizing the greatness of God. The fear of the Lord is coming upon him without Calvary. We should be experiencing God and the fear of the Lord through Calvary, which says, I'm not going to die, but I sure need corrected. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. Some of us think we've been in this so long, we don't need any correction. I'm telling you, I need correction. Just ask Sister Freeman. <laughs> no, I take that back. Don't ask her. <laughs> Whew. He said, I live among a people with filthy lips, yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from all the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, here am I. Send me. All three things can be found in this Isaiah 1 through 6. I've already mentioned the first. He recognized the Lord high and lifted up his train, filled the temple. Every piece of the train. Many of you have heard me preach this. Every time attachment is added, it's another victory, another victory, another victory. He never loses, so there's so many victories. It's undefeated God. He recognized. Secondly, he reported. Isaiah became a reporter of the Lord. And whose report will you believe? 
Mm. Same Isaiah that saw the Lord said this a few chapters later in Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who has believed our report? To whom and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah said, who, through the Holy Spirit, who's believing our report? Whose report you believe in? What, what? What report you believe in? You really believe in all that gloom, doom and despair, CNN, and all the other news channels are reporting? I, that's the question. It's okay to answer in church. Paul alludes to these verses and goes a little bit deeper in Romans 10. If you have your Bibles and want to flip over there real quickly, we're doing great. Come on, stay with me. You're still with me? Say a big amen. amen. I skipped about one and a half pages of notes, so we're going to make it. Romans 10, verse 15. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Can I tell you that you're being sent to do what? Report. What am I supposed to report? Watch this, watch this. I know you're turning to Romans 10, but you're so, you're so talented you can multitask. Because you're great, His greatness lives on the inside of you. So, bless that phone, Lord. Experience. What are you supposed to report? I saw the Lord. So, you have this experience. I saw. Come here. C -c -c Come here, Joe. I saw Him. And did you know He is incredibly great when I saw Him? I couldn't do anything but something like this because I realized... The fear of the Lord came upon me. And I wasn't afraid, like Isaiah, of dying because I'm living under the covenant the cow, of Calvary, of Jesus' blood. But I did sense a need for correction because I haven't ever compared myself to somebody like that. Woo! Holy, holy, holy. But also, he became a good reporter because he was over here after the experience with the Holy Spirit listening and learning and growing so that he could continue to write the book called Isaiah you don't think Isaiah was disciplined how you think he wrote a book that many hundreds of years ago without a computer and spell check <laughs> that's discipline my brothers and sisters <laughs> And so you just can't go over here, I, give me Isaiah 6. Yeah, you should. You need Isaiah 6. You need to see the greatness of God, expect the miraculous, expect the impossible. He is great and greatly to be praised. And I'm going to step into this greatness and say, Lord, purge my lips. Notice, for him to become a reporter, he had to use his mouth. Because a lot of what he wrote about is what he talked about and what he messages he went out and delivered. You've got a message delivered, but if you've got a foul mouth, it's hard to deliver a fair message because this message is fair a lot of Christians deliver a, a foul message a fouled up message let me let me explain you're going to hell you're going to burn <laughs> and then we don't tell the other side a lot of times I find extremes one way or the other yes there is a hell and yes you will burn without Jesus but he came he died. He rose again. He is who He said He is. He is the King of all glory. He will wash you, cleanse you, make you right. So you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. The message isn't foul. The message is fair. If you'll surrender and give all to Him, repent and turn and plan to go the, go the opposite direction, you come as you are, He'll clean you up. He doesn't clean you and then catch you. He catches you and then cleans you. Fair message. So, when God purges, that's what he did to Isaiah. Notice, first thing he did, purge his mouth. How many knows the tongue is the most unruly member of the entire body? And the reason so of, often qualified people become disqualified during the week is because they... <laughs> but if we can keep a healthy balance of here, I fear the, oh, the fear of the Lord is upon me. And here... I'm in the Word, I'm disciplined myself. Then when we're right here in the middle of the, in the world, God has purged our lips and we're watching what we say. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but how many found that as soon as it comes out of your mouth and it was wrong, it's like, oh God, I, shouldn't, I should have, forgive me, Lord. 
he, he works on his mouth because God wants him to be a reporter. Look to your neighbor and tell him you, you, you're called to be a reporter. <laughs> Emphasize the ter, reporter. To help him remember it. He may have not called you to work, work at THV Channel 11, but he's called you to work at the King's Channel. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? You've been sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. See, if you'll preach, if you'll report, your, your feet will be beautiful. <laughs> Verse 16. That right river bottoms, it'll be beautiful. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report what's the problem unbelief when you don't believe the report great incredible when you don't believe the report you won't give the report and so there's too much unbelief in the church because we have not had an up-to-date experience of the greatness of God and therefore we're not believing the report and therefore we're not giving the report or we're, we experience but then we're not following up with discipline and so when the devil comes, we just fall off track and we don't even have energy or strength to give a report. Somebody walks by and God says, tell them I love them. And you're just laying there like, tell them you love them. I don't even know for sure if you love me. How can I tell them? And God says, what about Sunday when I touch you and, and I, I... What about when I... Well, I don't feel it right now, God. Well, you don't walk by your feelings. You walk by faith. Oh, some of you thought I forgot. Here it is. We only quote verse 17. Here it goes. Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by what? The experience only? No. Faith comes by hearing the revelatory word of God. So God brings revelation out of the experience he puts us in the discipline and we continue to flow with revelation and therefore we're at, when we're here in the middle we're out in the real world we walk according to the Word of God as we recognize his greatness we're reporters of that greatness and last of all he remaps our life that simply means redirects puts us on the right track the last part of Isaiah 6 remember verse 8 the Lord started asking, who will go for us? Who will allow me to remap their lives? I don't care what your earthly vocation is. Your calling is to be a reporter of the Lord and to go and tell it on the mountain, Jesus Christ is Lord. So we need a remap. We need remap. I heard the Lord asking, who will allow me to send them and who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Send me. What happens? You recognize the greatness. You begin to allow him to cause you to walk in belief. And as you recognize his greatness, you become a reporter. And as a reporter of the Lord who is experiencing and being disciplined, you start traveling according to his map and not yours. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a road map. Some people call this a love letter. It is. But it's also a road map. <laughs> he not only wants to tell you how much he loves you, but he wants to tell you how much he desires to use you. Because he not only qualifies you love, but he gives you quantity and quality you said you said that earlier the first part of the service. I know but now it all ties together right and we learn by repetition so write those three words down as you're taking notes qualify quantify quality he gives you Bethlehem house of fresh bread whole storehouse too much bread you eat and you have too much. Therefore, you open your road map and you say, Okay, God, let's read it today. And now you not only read it as a discipline, but you get revelation over here and experience. And then you're at Walmart, you're at Mayflower Foods, you're at Harps, you're 
the dollar store, wherever you go, gas station. And God is calling the shots and he's giving you a map. You're at midnight oil. You're wherever you go. And he says, tell her. Tell him. Give him. Give him that $10. Give, you know what I'm saying? It, do that ministry. It can be th little, little things out there in the real world, and then it can be specific ministries. Get involved teaching children. Get involved working with uh, students, youth. Get involved working with young adults. Get involved working with single adults. Get involved in working with married couples. Get involved with, with the elderly. Get involved with... Anybody get what I'm saying? Amen. Cook meals. Do something. He's called all up. Remap your life. Watch this. Here's how he remaps it. I stop following a map that says, what is the best? <laughs> it's sort of like my phone does. It usually gives me three different ways to get there. Anybody have those GPS things on your phone? And so it has the fastest one and the second fastest and the third fastest. And, and so I have three different ways. But what we often follow is number one that represents what is the best route for Ronnie, that Ronnie will get the most out of it. But the map that God wants you to follow is which one does the king get the most out of? <laughs> Stand with me all across the room today.